Thank you for joining me. This is going to be a powerful session. In today's session, I interviewed Dr. Nicholas Samstag. Dr. Nick brings over 20 years, over two decades, clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst experience in private practice in New York. And listen, we're going to touch on some important topics today. What is psychological intelligence as it relates to scams and the manipulations that are used to separate you from your money? What are the verbal and nonverbal cues that you can look for in friends and loved ones, even in yourself, to recognize the early signs of manipulation? What is transference and how does that play into this whole equation of knowing if a person may be at risk? Is withdrawal or depression, social withdrawal or depression, is that a danger sign or is that potentially a good sign in this whole situation? What is psychological mindfulness and what are the steps you can take and what are the things you can do to improve your psychological mindfulness? And finally, what is savior syndrome? How do you recognize those signs and why are they a fallacy? Why are they a story that, they, that we tell ourselves? So again, this is going to be a highly powerful session. I know it's a long one, but I promise there's so many clinical insights and things we can learn in this conversation together that I hope you'll stay tuned in to the end. As many people aren't aware of, last year alone there were 8 million people who were defrauded, scammed by bad actors, cyber criminals. This amounted to $10.5 billion in losses. And when we think of scams, we tend to think oftentimes of just one-off kinds of occurrences, right? The phishing emails we get, the, the random spam phone calls we get. The reality is 4.6 billion of that 10.5 billion is what I term as long play scams. These are very sophisticated attacks. They begin with fake social media profiles, what law enforcement call sock puppet accounts, making people look alluring, attractive, intelligent, you know, successful, well-traveled. Then there's the random connection. It can happen on WhatsApp. It can happen on a dating app. Someone you don't know reaches out to you. Socially, most of us, you know, we want to be polite and we'll answer back. And that's the whole goal in this scam. Um, to get connected with you, to begin a conversation with you, and as quickly as possible build rapport with you, and learn about things that later can be used against you. It then moves to when the scammer feels like it's appropriate, it then moves to that stage where there's a pivot. Something financial is introduced. A family in need, cryptocurrency opportunity, ways to make hundreds of millions of dollars, whatever that might look like. Then there is the proof of concept, which is little nibbles at success. In a romance scam, I'm going to come and meet you, and I'm going to, I love you, and I can't wait to live my life with you, but I need a plane ticket, or my mom is XYZ. In the investment scam, just give me $1,000, and that 1000 turns into 3000 or 5000 as proof of concept. That happens a few times before the real manipulation begins to occur, which employs manipulative tactics that each of us or friends or family or loved ones that we know have experienced in real life every day. And these are being weaponized by scammers. And we'll talk about who those scammers are in this session as well. Um, so I wanted to spend time with you, and it's so valuable um, to learn from the experience you've had working you know, in the field for as long as you have with as many folks as you've helped. Tell us a little bit about your practice and what you've dedicated your career to. Um, so I'm a, uh, I had a, I had a very circuitous um, education and, and, and professional history, which I won't get into in any great detail, but suffice it to say that I didn't think I was going to be a clinical psychologist or a psychoanalyst until relatively late in the game. Um, and what got me into it was recognizing that I had certain patterns in my own life that were that were weird. Um, I, I blew up various opportunities in the business world. I was in publishing as a writer. Um, I was having sort of repetitive pattern problems with girlfriends. And I thought, something's up here. So I, um, I went to psychotherapy and uh, I was amazed and struck by how out of it I was. But I just hadn't had any idea of what it meant to look at oneself psychologically. Anyway, so I, I thought this is something I, I could do and certainly more interesting than writing advertising. 
promotional copy, which is what I was doing for a long time, making a lot of money for corporations that I didn't really care much about. Um, and so I, I did that and uh, I got a PhD and I thought, you know, this is nice, but what I really want to do with my life is be a psychoanalyst because I thought that was really the deeper work and the most interesting and nuanced work, um, clinically speaking. So I've been doing that for a bunch of years and I, I taught for 30 years and I did this and I did that. But basically, um, I see people, I see people whose, um, whose life have, have, has, have come to a point where it's either unmanageable or they, like me, um, have perceived certain patterns uh, that they really want to understand, um, whether it's the repetitive patterns in relationship or whether it's um, issues with, you know, substance abuse. Um, and so what I, what, I, what I tell people what I do is I help them write better stories um, because I, th I think the stories we tell of ourselves, of, of our past, really um, in many ways uh, implicate who, who it is we are and, and how we're going to be in the world. They, they, it's kind of like a script or a blueprint that we use to, 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 uh, to live by. <clears throat> and I think better stories are those stories that are psychologically informed and nuanced and contradictory and not unlike great literature. That's why we call it great literature is because they're not cartoons. And so I think all of us, I certainly was, um, I certainly was guilty of this. You know, we, we tell stories that are really poor stories and they're more like cartoons. This was bad. That was good. They're, they lack nuance that they lack depth. And, uh, and so, you know, what I find is if it's a good fit between me and the people I work with, they end up telling much better stories and much more useful stories and are able to sit with contradictions and thoughts and feelings that aren't necessarily nice but are necessary to uh, necessary to encounter if we're going to get the most out of living. So that's what I do. That is, you know, a beautiful life mission. And thank you for sharing that it began with a quest to better yourself, right? And as so many folks do, we seek experts to help guide us through those difficult waters of life. And, you know, what's important to recognize and what I want to start to dive into is I'm sure everyone listening is intelligent in many different ways. However, you may not be intelligent in the ways that make you vulnerable to scams. We have the aggregate of our life experience that we bring to the equation, but these manipulative tactics being used are oftentimes well beyond you know, our financial experience. They prey on vulnerabilities. But if we start to think about real life experiences, either that we've had or that folks we know or love have had, we know the signs of manipulation. We just don't always recognize them in the moment they're occurring. And there are psychological and physiological impacts to us as these things are happening as well. So let's begin with this question. Um, as you are working with a new client, what are the signs, both verbal and nonverbal, that you might observe that would make you suspect perhaps they're under the influence of someone manipulative in their life or a bad actor playing a role in their life? Um, that's, a, that's, that's a great question. And there are many, there, there's not many, maybe not many, there are several ways of answering that. I, I, I think the first thing that occurs to me is um, if someone comes into my office and they're, uh, they're clearly interested in pleasing me before they know me, that's a clue. If they if they're overly nice and solicitous, if they you know, if they compliment me, if they are impressed by my degrees on the wall, if they go out of their way to sort of uh, make me feel important, I wonder about that because they don't know me. <laughs> mm. Lots of people have degrees on their walls, and you know, um, I don't I don't sit on the throne. Um, so. That's that's called transference in the field, and that's that's a sign. Often, uh, it's a defense. Often that people have where they are frightened, and one way of combating their fear is is by overly complimenting or sucking up to um, other people. Uh, and so, you know, that's often correlated with other types of things. But it, it's hard to generalize. But as a specific example. I would say that I would say people pleasers are as a group 
um, more vulnerable to being manipulated. Because if, 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 if the people pleaser is coming in contact with someone who's nefarious and, uh, and interested in manipulating them, their work's half done because the person's, the, the person's, you know, right, but they're, they're, they're low hanging fruit, I think, for the, for the scammer. Wow. So I think there's probably a spectrum as well. And I think in the beginning, let's just say psychologically underdeveloped tools, let's call it that. Let's say we're not always equipped to deal with manipulative people in our life. And in the beginning, we seek approval. And it sounds like that's exactly what this transference is. I would say across that spectrum, the deeper the manipulation gets, the more withdrawn a person might become. They might experience signs of depression, uh, socially withdrawing from friends and family, um, and those types of things. Would that be correct? Yeah, I think, I think you know, as I've said before, I, I think generalization is necessary and dangerous. I mean, I, I think there are all kinds of ways of responding to all kinds of stimuli. Um, if someone's actually withdrawn and depressed, in a way, that's a good sign because they're, they're, they're having adverse feelings. Um, I, you know, in, in, in a way, I worry about those people less than I do about the ones who are getting manipulated and pushed around and, and aren't experiencing anything particularly untoward. I said, oh, that's, that's more of a problem. Um, but I think as we were talking, you know, I think the, the general statement is, you know, how psychologically aware is this person? And when they come into my office, it doesn't mean that they are. I mean, they, they come to my office because they, they perceive that something's up that they want to talk about. Um, but psychological mindedness means, you know, among other things, it means having a having a, a fairly realistic notion of how people function and what's what's likely and what's what's unlikely. Um, and that's not taught in schools, and families don't teach kids that. And it, you know, it's you, you can't teach it really. You have to you have to grow into it and think about it. You know, I think as listeners are processing what you just shared. There are a couple really good indicators for, you know, what they can look out for. And certainly in conversations um, with friends, loved ones, or in internal conversations with themselves, there's some meaningful questions to ask themselves in the beginning of this experience. But something you shared before we started the recording, I think is probably the most prescient or along, you know, equal to being the most prescient. And that is <laughs> if you get an outreach from someone you don't know, Assume it's a scammer. Prove yourself wrong. Yeah, you know, I think that's right. I mean, I th I think the and this has been said a thousand times now, right? The, the internet isn't one thing, and I think I think one one image I use often when people are dealing with internet stuff is, is just to think about think of it as a country. Right, the internet's a country, and as a country, there are all kinds of interesting things and lovely things and um, moving things in that country. And there are also people who want to kill you, and there are people who want to take advantage of you, and there are dark alleys, and there are, you know, and, and so I would, just, yes, I, th I think that's right. I think I would just assume that anyone who contacts you, the, whom you don't know, who wants any money or to meet you or any of that business, just assume that they're a son of a bitch, <laughs> <laughs> because they probably are, you know, and, and, and this is, you know, this is part of my job that, I, I, you know, I, I don't relish. But I do spend a lot of time saying to people like there, you know, there are there are evil, really screwed up people in the world who wake up in the morning and want to do you harm. And there always have been. That's another thing in terms of psychological naivete. Like none of this is new. I mean, the internet is new, but scamming is not new. Scamming, rape, horrible things, abduction, um, none of that's new. That's always happened, and it probably always will happen. I mean, I don't like to be the messenger for that kind of thing but come on why would that change that's been going on since since we crawled out of the soup you know so i think i think it really behooves us to be um not paranoid obviously but completely suspect when people appear out of the blue and say they're going to do these wonderful things because by and large that's not going to happen and never ever 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 send anybody money and certainly don't meet anybody i mean how many people do i know who get on these dating apps you know, and and they in the middle of the night, you know, and they and they go and they meet people and they get robbed or or worse. Like, don't do that. That's not smart. 
So many of our listeners may not be aware, and Dr. Nick and, and I were talking about this prior to starting the recording, we tend to think of scammers as one-off individuals. Um, but in fact, in most cases, they're not. According to UN estimates, in the country of Myanmar alone, there are over 120,000 human trafficking victims. They've been lured there by the offers of jobs that don't exist, taken under armed guard under threat of death. And I'm not making this up. I'll post in the show notes um, some of the evidence that, that all of you can review. They are given a playbook. They are trained. They're assigned a manager. They're given quotas. They're working six, seven days a week, 17 hours a day sometimes. If they don't hit their quotas, they're being beaten, they're being electrocuted, they're being imprisoned. Some of them are even being killed. Their quotas are based on how many people they can scam. It is by way of organized crime, specifically in the Southeast Asian region, um, that these things are occurring. And they are literally weaponizing manipulation techniques that we all experience or loved ones have experienced in our in our normal lives they're weaponizing these tactics against us to defraud us from our money so let's talk now dr nick if we could what happens to a person psychologically physiologically as they come under the influence of a manipulative person in their life well what 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 happens is that they somehow they somehow get to believe that if they um, if they surrender to this person, all kinds of good things will happen. It's a you know it's a it's a very malevolent um, uh, you know apple stick kind of thing. Like I'll give you the apple, and if you don't want it, I'll I'll give you the stick until you want the apple. Um, uh, and that's you know that's 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 really a problem. I think I, th this is a this is not exactly to your question, but I'm just thinking about it. I think it's important. I think an image to an image to think of. When you're dealing with the internet, is what's it like to be an investigative reporter, right? Like you don't have to be paranoid, but you do have to be very curious. And and so I think um, I said that before, but I think the, I think you know investigative reporters. My my daughter is just working for the Post over the summer, and they don't they don't let her get away with anything. I mean, you have to ask a thousand questions. So if somebody calls you up and says whatever they say, you know, you you have about ten questions you have to ask, and if if, if those answers aren't to your liking, then you say thank you no, and you you, you just hang up the phone, or you, you get off the um, get off the screen. Uh -huh. So, you know, these are very good um, common sense approaches. But the reality is, when we are in the heat of the moment, our prefrontal cortex sometimes shuts down. We experience the allure of an attractive stranger who seems to be showing interest in us, and what gets released, right? that, um, you know, that love inducing chemical that makes us feel like, you know, there's an attraction here and it changes the complexity of our thinking. It rewires synapses along the way. Um, conversely, the opportunity to meet someone new who's interesting, who can show you how to make all the money you want in your life. There's other chemicals that get released, right? And there's a dopamine reward mechanism that occurs. Talk to us a little bit about physiologically what occurs under these kinds of circumstances? Yeah, I mean, you said it. I, I mean, there are, uh, there are, there are neuro, neurochemicals that get activated that, that give us a sense of euphoria and specialness. We talked about this before, before we went on air, right? So, so we all wanna feel special and you know, it's great to feel special. Um, and this is one of the major, major, um, <clears throat> major techniques that um that these people have is that they make you feel very special so if you're if you're someone who isn't particularly feeling special and this this good looking exciting person comes along and makes you feel special then yes then your your synaptic clefts will be flooded with all kinds of euthymic euthymic just meaning um happy inducing chemicals and what do you do <laughs> Call me. Um, what do you do? I mean, you, you know, I I'll just repeat this over and over again. I think I think once there's a very tough question you're asking me actually because, you know, once once you have a biochemical lock like you're describing, and once you have a behavioral lock and a psychological lock, then you know the game is on, 
And so what do you do then? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know what you can do. I think you can do many things before that takes place, but what do you do when it takes place? I mean, I, I like to say, you know, you, you start getting curious or you, you know, you ask yourself like, what's going on around here? Um, but I, I, I think in a sense, it's too late. If all that's, if all that's firing up, you're, you're in. Um, and I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure you actually can do anything, frankly. Well, let's probe this a little bit further. Um, because I'm interested to know as you are, and I assume you're a coach, you're a mentor, you're a consultant, you don't always take the side of the expert. In fact, I don't think you do. Instead, you say, I'm a resource to you, right? And you begin to have conversations with folks and you begin to probe in to their circumstances, more importantly, their worldview and how that influences their circumstances. And I would imagine that you also arm them with thoughts and questions they can begin to ask, responses that they can begin to add to that uh, psychological toolkit that they may have to better equip them to circumstances, right? Would that be correct? Often. I, I think when people get hooked like this, um, it's just a matter of time before something of a particularly horrible order happens. So someone is someone is hurt, someone is 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 physically abused. Um, and then perhaps the victim sort of wakes up. Um, but otherwise, I think, you know, it's like um are you are you familiar with the folie a deux um, idea? I am, but please expand for the audience. So, so folie a deux is a is a, a an old diagnostic label, which sometimes I think is still perfectly applicable, where two people are kind of um, unconsciously and psychotically locked into a psychological dependence. So they feel that they absolutely need each other for everything. They can't be anywhere without one another. They have one mind, one body, one soul. And it's pretty nuts. It's, it's pretty psychotic, actually. Um, and something, something can happen between victim and perpetrator in the, in the scamming scenario where you know, the, the, the victim is like the person in the folie deux, and the perpetrator knows it's happening. So the perpetrator will um, validate the notion of, of the victim's specialness and how they as a couple perhaps are special and everything's wonderful. It's that, you know, for anyone who's ever been involved with narcissists, um, it's very seductive because narcissists have, and I, I'm, not, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not diagnosing anybody, perpetrators or victims, but I think, I think from, the, from the perpetrator standpoint, I think it's fair to say that they all have massive personality disorders. They all have some combination of narcissism, borderline, cluster C. They, they, they're, they're not well people psychologically because they get their jollies from hurting other people, right? So we all recognize that as, um, as uh, aberrant and, and, uh, and, and pathological. But um, having, you know, I, I've treated many narcissists. I grew up with a few. <laughs> and uh, when, they, when they shine their light on you, it's extremely effective. You feel very special and very important and like you can do no wrong. Um, and as long as that light keeps shining, you're you're trapped. I think. I mean, unless you know, unless one of your friends friends pulls you aside and says, you know, what are you doing here? Yes, <clears throat> and that's going to bring us to probably um, the final question that I have for you that I want to talk through. And I'm going to set this up by saying, friends and loved ones can oftentimes see the signs of something occurring that we, under the heat of the moment, under the bright light of a narcissist shining on us and making us feel special, we might not see, frankly, we may not want to see. We may be just reveling in the experience. A part of us might even know, you know, it's just not gonna lead where I think it's gonna lead, but I don't care, it feels so damn good right now. There's such rewards going on, right? Um, so I wanna talk about, in just a moment, um, how friends and loved ones can maybe help, right? What are the things they can ask? What are the things they can look for? What suggestions would you give to folks you're working with? But I first want to touch on the folia de for a moment. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, very nice. <laughs> awesome. Um, <Very> well. <laughs> 
There is a story that CNN exposed. A gentleman who um, went under a pseudonym of CY. CY was contacted on WhatsApp, ran a message from a photo that was of a beautiful woman. And he tells his story. He, you know, checked out her profile, you know, really flattered that she would accidentally contact him. They struck up a conversation. As they got to know one another, quote unquote, it seemed to have moved very quickly. Um, but she gained personal information about CY, specifically that his father was in the hospital with a pretty debilitating uh, medical issue, and the medical bills were stacking up. Well, guess what? That was the cue to Jessica, quote unquote, to say, well, you know, I haven't told you, but I am an expert in cryptocurrency and I invest in small businesses. Maybe I can help you and maybe we can, you know, get you give your father the life he deserves, you know, would that be of interest to you? And of course, CY said yes, right? And just as I described, invest a little, get a little, invest a little, get a little. Here's where the folio adieu um, scenario really came to play. I've read the texts back and forth between them where he's like, I can't believe it. I just made $60,000 in 10 minutes. Thank you so much. You've changed my life. My life is in your hands now. I love you. You know, you're you're an angel, right? All of this supported. Let me tell you the end of the story. CY lost one point eight million dollars in 30 days. Oh my god. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm sure friends and family saw things, heard things that said to them, listen, this might be a problem. But maybe they made a awkward attempt at intervention. Maybe they didn't know what to do. So think about, you know, folks you've helped in your clinical experience. How do you help them help others who are in tough situations that they share with you? You know, <laughs> we all want to believe in magic. I mean, we're all kids once and we all love magic by and large. And we, we, we want to think that the world is magical and great things happening. We also, we haven't talked about this. I also think that there's um, in, in, in most, if not all cultures, um, a, a great example of savior fantasy. You know, they want, we want to be saved. We want to be knighted. We want to be saved. We want to be special. We want to be told we're the best. Um, and I think that that's, um, you know, if we have family members or friends who suddenly tell us like, oh my God, I just met so-and-so online and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, just don't believe it. And, you know, and tell them in no, no uncertain terms that they're, you know, they're being nutty by, by uh, believing that this is true. It's horrible. It's horrible. Um, and, and again, the point here isn't to be cynical, but it is to be psychologically realistic. And psychological realism isn't pretty. It's not pretty. It's not, it's not Christian. It's not pretty. I mean, it's not, you know, it's messy. It's dark. It's not nice. And, and you know, most of us are not equipped to, uh, to embrace all of that. We want to th think that life is Donnybrook Farm a lot of the time. And it, it, it's not. And it's never going to be. You know, let me paraphrase a little bit what you just said, because I think that savior syndrome, I believe you called it, is a really important principle. We all want to be saved. We want to meet that person that's going to change the trajectory of our lives, right? Romantically, financially, whatever the case may be. Under the throes of this, someone we care about doesn't want to hear, hey, look, you might be getting scammed. They don't want to hear those things. What they may want to hear, and you tell me if I'm correct in this, what they may want to hear is, listen, I'm excited for you, and I hope this is exactly everything you want in your life. I would encourage you to ask some more questions and really ensure that it's everything that you hope that it is. And that validation is going to really empower you to do more with this person down the road. But let's take a moment and talk about, you know, some questions you can ask, some things you can think about, some things you can investigate to make sure, to be sure that this is exactly the situation as you perceive it today. Would that be okay to talk about together? Um, I'm not sure that that's going to be successful, you know, 80, 90% of the time when people are in the thrall of this kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, that's what you just said is a lovely way of doing that. You know, you know, a less lovely way of doing that would be to say something like, are you a bloody idiot? You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, 
you know, do you think that, you know, Jesus is going to come and bless you? And I mean, you know, I mean, at a certain point, um, I get frustrated with my patients um, and they get frustrated with me, which is fine. Um, but, you know, one, one doesn't even have to be scammed, right? Like how many people get involved in relationships with people online and otherwise where they don't really know much about them? And, and in, that, in that case, this is off the subject, but in that case, it's not like they're getting bilked or duped, but they just don't know who they're dealing with. And so the person's married or they have a family or they're, you know, they're running guns in Nicaragua. I don't know, but they don't know. They don't know anything about this. <laughs> so I so I think what can they do? They can be they can be kind of bloody minded. And remember, um, sorry, remember um Columbo? Do you remember the TV show Columbo? You know, it's kind of funny. <laughs> he was he was a great interpersonal psychoanalyst because what he would do is he would ask all the questions. Nobody else, nobody else asked, right? Like, mm. Mr. Jones, you say that you were in France on Sunday, but why is it that we found a receipt in your hotel room? I mean, it was, you know, it was all, it was all about um, critical thinking, really. It was all about how do you get from here to there? And we don't do that. And, and, and actually, and this, isn't, this is a little off subject, but um, you know, in my training, one of, the, one of the techniques, if it even is a technique, um, was from a famous a famous psychoanalyst called the psycho the, the psychiatric interview and the psychiatric interview is just about being curious and some people find that really um, affirming you ask them a lot of questions and they feel like they they really understood and and other people can't stand it and so I I think that notion of <clears throat> curiosity and asking questions is a really um, is a really practical thing to think about. Because if you're asking people questions, and I don't mean arbitrary, stupid questions, <laughs> I mean thoughtful questions. If you're asking them thoughtful questions and they have adverse responses, then something's going on. You know, why are they so protective? Where'd you go to school? Where, you know, where'd you live? Did you have siblings? If those, you know, if, anyway, point made. Curiosity will save you. That's what I'm trying to say. Couldn't have said it better. You know, and this has been a, a very uh, enlightening and empowering conversation. I want to say to those of you listening, first of all, thank you for tuning in. Secondly, if things that we've talked about today resonate for you personally or in that circle of influence, family members, whatever the case may be, uh, if they resonate for you and you might want to develop some additional resources, I'm going to post a link to Dr. Nick's website and um, reach out to him. He is certainly, as you've heard, a knowledgeable, very viable resource that can help you navigate these complex waters. Um, Dr. Nick, this has been you know, fascinating topic to dive into. And at the end of the day, if you and I together can help one person not get scammed, not fall victim, this is ruining lives. This is ending lives in some cases. If we can help even one person, we can both feel very good. But the reality is, I think we're going to help a lot of people through this episode. So, man, thank you so much for carving out time to meet with me today. I really appreciate it. I hope to have you back someday soon. Well, thank you so much, Phil. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you'll agree that this was a powerful and impactful and in some cases, life-changing conversation that we had with Dr. Nick. I hope you took away some tools, resources, ideas, whether it be for you or someone you know or care about. Um, falling victim to the manipulative tactics employed by scammers is very easy to do for all the reasons we covered in this episode. And that's why we wanted to talk about the things we did. I want to thank you all for tuning in. I know it was a longer session, but I hope you saw value in it. I hope if you haven't done so already, you'll click the thumbs up. Um, subscribe, please, if you haven't. Share this with others if you can. And please tune in for future episodes. Have a great day.